Hi, welcome to the Sanctuary Christian Fellowship. Today's message is called I See You. How many of you need a, spirit, a spiritual lift from now and then? We all do, yeah? Uh, Romans 12, 8 says, If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If we look close enough, we would see people who need to be encouraged all over us every day of our lives. There are some fantastic days when we feel like we're top of the world and everything uh, seems to fall in place. Life is good. God is good all of the time. But there are few times when it appears that everything we do, no matter how we try, is falling apart. Have you been there? I have. When trying times come, and they will, we need to learn to shut down and reboot before we crash and burn and fall off the edge. I remember when I scheduled time to be negative. It was on Wednesday afternoons at 6 p.m. All week I promised to be positive, to bite my tongue and to smile at the wave when things were not going my way, when things get sour. And if anything negative happened, I logged it down and I was going to deal with it on Wednesdays at 6 a.m. Excuse me, 6 p.m. I was going to throw a big pity, pity party. Poor me. Okay. Uh, Wednesdays at 6 p.m., I was going to be really, really negative and I had an open invitation to anyone who wanted to join me. We would complain, we would blame, and we would release our frustrations. And after that, we felt clean and we'll do it all over again. If we're really honest with ourselves, sometimes it's easier to have a big pity party rather than to pull ourselves together together and do what God tells us to do, to go to him and, f and um, explain to him how we feel and allow him to refresh and to reboot us. But no, some of us don't do it. Why? Being pitiful is better than being peaceful sometimes because it became a familiar place with us. I was going through my email on Wednesday, one Wednesday, and it was almost 6 p.m. I was ready for my, my pity party. It was, with, it was filled with the usual stuff. Ministry communications, spam. Prayer requests, more spam. Okay, need time or advice, more spam. Free golf clubs. Ooh, that got my attention. I logged on, and as I expected, it was too good to be true. What a waste of time. But one small email got my attention. It was one of our dear friends whom I gave some advice and I prayed for. It says, thanks, Pastor. You're the best ever. Wow. In the email world, when you respond with capital letters and multiple excl exclamation points, it means the sender wants you to know that they appreciate that you helped them. You can almost hear them shouting in cyberspace. I responded, Thanks for your encouragement. She wrote back, that's what family and friends are for. Love you. It was wonderful. And when Jesus uses people to encourage us in the exact moment when we need to cancel our Wednesdays at 6 p.m. These are I see you people. God uses to remind us that he sees us, he loves us, he cares for us, and they do too. In our world, it has become too busy and it becomes we become so self-absorbed busyness rules men are too busy being busy and don't notice opportunities to encourage one another to get to encourage people that we meet along the way especially in our families encouraging other doesn't have to be attached to any kind of monetary cost it takes just a little time from your heart maybe a word a gesture a smile maybe a thumbs up, a pat on the back, a hug, or even a tear can be encouraging. However, all encouragements have to be genuine. Take some time to look at somebody and to give them some encouraging words like, I care about you, you're the best, okay? I love the way that you cook or whatever it is. Be an encourager today. Be a person who builds up rather than people who tears down. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Hebrews 13.3 says, Encourage one another okay, day after day as long as it's still today. Don't put up encouraging people for tomorrow. Encourage people now when you see, when you see something. 
to, uh, to encourage them by. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. What wonderful scriptures. The truth is there's too many critics. Amen? Too much emphasis is given on the wrong and not enough on the positive and how to improve. Proverbs 3.27 says, Do not withhold good from those whom it is due when it is your power to do it. Important, especially with little kids. They will mess up many times, but when you encourage them to do good and to learn, they'll usually do it. When you recognize someone doing good, or at least trying to do their best, encourage them. Lily and I love to go walking, and the other day we were walking in the neighborhood, and we saw a guy fixing his car. And uh, we just stopped by to change pleasantries. We found out that he was a retired mechanic. His name was Moon. And I said, man, you do good work. And he smiled. And Lily said, you're always smiling, yeah? And he said, yeah, I get better smile than not smile. So we just, they, we encourage each other. So it's a really great time. We have enough to be discouraged about. Amen? Man, we can't, it's, life is filled with discouragement. But remember this, you will find what you're looking for. If you look for dirt, guess what you'll find? dirt. So we need to be, be persons who look for good in every situation. There are several stories written in the Bible telling of how people chose to see the light in the darkest places in their lives. The Apostle Paul learned the secret of contentment. The woman at the well, blind Bartimaeus, the woman who suffered from for 12 years with an issue of blood. How about uh, a cripple who was who suffered for 38 years at the same place when Jesus approached him. And how about a man named Legion who had many demons living inside of him in his personal dark time? Everyone has personal dark times and need encouragement. They all had life-changing encounters with Jesus. One of my favorite stories is about Paul and Silas who were unjustified but unjustifiably beaten, tied, placed in a dark and dirty prison for an undetermined amount of time. They didn't know when they were get, um, to, weren't going, going to get out. They didn't complain or blame God. Instead, they began to praise and worship Him in the midst of their dire moment, the darkest time in their life. And as they sang praise and worship, okay, in the midst of their suffering, other, other prisoners were listening. I wonder what they thought about Paul and Silas. They lost it, right? Uh, in the midst of the worship, miracles happened. All the locks were opened and, and the prisoners didn't escape. Paul stopped the jailer from killing himself. Paul saw the opportunity in these dark times to share God's light, the gospel with him. Then his whole family were saved and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Remember this, no matter how dire your situation is, Praising God and expecting a miracle is what we do. Paul encourages the churches to continue their, in their faith in spite of their problems and persecutions they face daily. He wanted them to finish well. He didn't focus on their faults, though there were many, but chose to motivate them by refocusing on God's promises and applauded their every effort. And we should do the same. Most of the time we know that we blew it, right? We've blown, but we don't need anyone to tell us that we blew it, okay? Some of us are sufficiently hard on ourselves. No added comments needed. So hearing criticisms from others can be very counterproductive and very, very hurtful. We all need to be using encouraging words and we need to speak encouraging words to others. Encouragement helps us to work through the pain of suffering and the pain of mistakes. Remember this, the right words at the right time can mean the difference between finishing strong or stumbling along the way. One of my greatest pet peeves is hearing discouraging critical words coming from people with authority. It just, psh, I'm blown away by it. When I was watching a few years ago, a little, uh, a little league practice one afternoon. The boys were about 10 years old and heard some ugly four-letter words coming out of a coach trying to correct one of his players. Man, I, it took everything for me not to say something. 
I was really surprised at this coach's attitude, his choice of words, and he abused his authority. The Bible tells us that the power of life and death is in our words, what we say. Ephesians 4, 29 and 32 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind. Now repeat that. Be kind. And compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God. That's a hard one sometimes, right? Just two words, though. Be kind. May I suggest that whenever you have an opportunity uh, to make corrections, Choose your words carefully. Choose the higher road. Encouragement builds hope and confidence, and hope and confidence develops perseverance. Perseverance leads to finishing well. Without encouragement, confidence and hope are absent. And if we are absent people, we will struggle to finish across the, the finish line, or even worse, people quit. Be generous with encouragement. Proverbs 3, 27 and 28 says, Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later. I'll give it tomorrow when you have, have it with you. In other words, be liberal with, with, with your encouragement. If they need any kind of encouragement, sometimes you can just take a look at your spouses or your children, okay, your grandchildren or your friends or neighbor, and they're kind of despondent. They're kind of under... You know, under duress. Speak a speak an encouraging word. Encouraging words are never out of season, in the wrong timing, or out of fashion. Intentionally look for opportunities to be the voice of encouragement. Do you want to smile? Then smile. Do you want to be complimented or recognized? Then compliment and recognize others. Do you want more joy in your life? Then be more joyful in your life. Do you want more friends? Then be a friend. You get the point? Amen? That's really important. Okay? What you get is what you give away. It works all the time. But it has to be genuine. Mark 7, 6 says, The people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I remember having people around me that taught, now, I thought was really genuine and really cared for me, but later discovered they were artificial to the core. Oh, Pastor, you're just a good speaker. Oh, Pastor, you're so anointed. Can you do this? You're so gifted. God has called you. Da la 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 la. And I believe them. Okay? They call me the next superstar. <laughs> Man, twinkle, twinkle, yeah? But when they're not around, it's a different story. Okay? My constant goal is to surround myself with people who truly love God and truly love me too. True friends are difficult to find. Can I hear an amen to that? Right? You are, usually, uh, they, you are really blessed if you have a few of them. You know, the ones that, in spite of all your flaw, flaws, uh, they'll love you in spite of them. Um, they accept the real you. Uh, the, okay, the ones that you feel safe about and the ones who encourage you most, you feel most important and fulfilled around them. They don't want anything from you. They just enjoy being around you. I love my wife. <laughs> If you're like the rest of us normal families, sometimes we live in a mystery, don't we? What happened to the other sock? <laughs> we started off with brand new socks, but okay, both sides, but in a few days, one is missing somewhere. And, you know, we can't find it. It can seem to find, where, where did it go? We have two choices. We can find one that matches close to it, or we can buy new ones. Sadly, friends can disappear like socks. We don't seem to have the time or energy or to nurture friendships and somehow they disappear right in front of our eyes. What happened? Jesus puts high value on the priority of friendships, real friendships. He ate with his friends, traveled with them, built his ministries with them. He served them, loved them, and had really some really true compassion and humility for them. He loved and always encouraged them, always. And we are created by God to need other people like that. Remember this, encouragement fertilizes your soul. 
speak life. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 says, But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. The words we say are important because it exposes the condition of our hearts. Sometimes our words can be our own best enemy. A critical heart will speak belittling words. A bitter heart speaks hurtful words. A critical heart speaks judgmental words. A thankless heart speaks words of grumble. It's totally opposite of what this scripture says. It would be wise to consider the outcome of our spoken words. Words matter. Hurtful words of criticism, defeat, hatred, failure, negativity, and hopelessness eventually will produce death, spiritual death in your life. The Apostle Paul cautions us to speak only words that will benefit others. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, but only what it is helpful to build others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Are your words beneficial? Hmm. On the other hand, a loving heart speaks uplifting words. A contented heart, words of faith. A humble heart, words of acceptance. A joyful heart, grateful words. Love, contentment, humility, and joy, these qualities within ourselves will help speak life to those around us. To speak life means to give words of hope and encouragement, edification, support, and love. When you let your conversations be always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Colossians 6.4 says, in other words, speak life. <coughs> Self-talk. How many of you talk to yourself? We all do. What is your response when God asks you to do something? We often respond to our doubts and our fears and, and uh, we tell him what we can't do. Our self-talk justifies why we can't. Okay? Um... I don't know how to do it, I don't have time, I'm afraid, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too this or that, yada, yada, yada. We often talk ourselves out of being used by God. Then God asks another question. Um, who told you you can't do it anyway? Are you willing to do it if I help you? Hmm, can we do it together? I want to partner with you. Um, when I really take a look at that, he says, um, God really gets to the heart of the matter. He digs deep into a person's heart. God listens and quietly and carefully hears your response, and he won't interrupt you or he won't condemn you. Uh, but he wants to see the true condition of a heart. He doesn't necessarily le uh, listen to our words, but he examines our heart. How can we say no to Jesus after all he has done for us? He's going to help us. Isn't that exciting? Okay, what he asks us to do will profoundly bless him. That's why he asks us. He will bless others as well as ourselves. However, God doesn't and will never force us to obey him or to surrender to him or to serve him. Now, what is really important is that the way we respond and how thankful we are. In Luke 7, uh, 17, uh, 15 to 90, he talks about uh, 10 lepers yelling out to Jesus to get his attention to heal them. And what's really, really, really profound as I read this, he said one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. I can only imagine that the other nine were part of the, Jew, the, the Jewish community. They knew of Jesus. The Samaritan, who was considered a foreigner and an outsider, didn't. After Jesus healed all of them, only one returned, the Samaritan. While the other nine probably returned to their normal. Okay, and But the Samaritan, his life was never the same again. He saw that he was healed. He came back and praised God with a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was grateful. His life was never the same again. The nine represents those who cry out to the Lord 
in time of need, in time of fear and worry, in time when only God can save them from their demise. However, after God answers their cries for help, they soon return to their to once once they were. Jesus never turns away from them, though. Even though they were ungrateful. This is what really true love does. Yeah? He is patiently waits for them to repent, to return their lives around again, like the Samaritan did. Perhaps the, then I need another touch of God's mercy and his grace. Jesus never gives up on, on the nine. We too need to search our hearts and ask a tough question only we know the true answer to. Do I have a heart like the one or the nine? The Samaritan was made well because of his faith and his gratitude, and his life was transformed to be more like Jesus. How do you keep your soul healthy and thriving? Here it is. It's with heavy doses of gratefulness. People will grow emotionally and spiritually more resilient and robust when they are encouraged and they are appreciated. We all need to be encouraged and to be encouragers especially when times get tough. When we need a spiritual boost, we need to learn to devote more time with Jesus, not less time, to run to Him, not away from Him. Many times, just a few moments with Christ is all that we need. We need to get up, we need to dust, dust ourselves up, and do it all over again. Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Do you need encouragement? Do you need rest? Go to the Father. Heavenly Father, we all need to be encouraged and to be encouragers. Help us to be aware of the opportunities you place in our lives to be your voice, your heart, to share your gospel with those in need, those in need of your grace and your mercy. We ask that you increase our passion for your word and for your presence in our lives. Remove the things that only robs us from the joy of living our lives and pleases you, Lord, and honors you. Help us to see that what you see, hear what you hear, and obey what you ask us to do willingly. Thank you for asking us to partner with you to accomplish your purposes. I, we know that you can. You don't need us, Father. We need you. But in your grace and your mercy, you have asked us to partner with you to accomplish your will. Continue to transform our lives to be more like you. We are blessed by you, Father. Happy Father's Day in the name of Jesus. Aho we hope we see you next time.